All right. Hello, Jennifer. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, before we jump in and start talking about your journey with video, I would love if you could just tell the audience a little bit about yourself, where you're from, the type of work you do, just the basic stuff. So I have uh, a little idea of who we're talking to today. Sounds great. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for having me on your podcast today. I am located in Winnipeg, Canada, and I am I'm on a journey myself. I am switching into the coaching industry. And in order to do that, I needed to do a little bit more self-development and I needed to increase my skill set in order to do that. Part of developing my skill set was learning how to create videos. Part of my coaching business is going to be creating videos for my clients. I knew I had to um, get close to that <laughs> and yeah. to uh, get comfortable with creating videos if I wanted to make this next move in my career. And so that's kind of what started, how I started. So did you start making videos before you had made the transition in your career, after or, or kind of simultaneously? I did it before, Jonathan. So I had actually, to back it up a bit, I wanted to take some tr life coach training. Mm -hmm. And it was during that professional training that I was also watching people on LinkedIn every day come forward and create videos around their passions, around their missions. They would regularly post content that I too wanted to speak about. And I just knew that writing wasn't my first, mm, let's say, that wasn't my most comfortable writing. Actually, no. I'm more comfortable talking. And so to put me in front of camera felt a little bit more comfortable as using that as a medium. However, once you put that camera on, it does change a little bit for you. Yeah. <laughs> it does put things into perspective for you because now all of a sudden you have to have that maybe that message, right? and I need to know who I'm speaking to. And so I didn't have all that laid out and ready to go the first time I created my video. What I did have is a passion. I had a passion to get my message out. And in order to do that, if writing wasn't my natural and talking was, then I knew I had to get out of my comfort zone and do something creative, something new, something that pushed me to be able to learn how to express myself, how to express my ideas. And coming to camera was a really good way to practice. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something you said there, um, I haven't really heard before, and it, 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 it's at least similar to my experience. And I'll ask you to kind of specify there, and we'll figure out you know, how similar it is. But you talked about how you were watching other people post mm -hmm. their content, post their ideas, post their message and their mission. And you almost felt maybe left out, right? That you wanted to be saying that stuff too. And that stuff, you yes. thought about that stuff too. So for me, this, uh, this channel, one of the big things that pushed me to the point of actually doing it instead of just letting it sit in my mind as an idea is not actually that I saw other people doing it, but I knew that somebody would. It was almost a fear of missing out type thing where I, I couldn't live with myself if a year from now I saw someone enter this space and start talking and speaking and training and really creating content around getting comfortable on camera. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was almost a fear of missing out, thinking about it like, man, if somebody else does this, how am I going to feel knowing that I was wanting to do this a year ago? I just didn't have the, the, the nerve to. Mm -hmm. Where you, it seems similar, although people were actually already doing it and you, you know, didn't want to miss out on all the fun, so to speak. Is that right? at all correct? Yes. And then I had colleagues that were coming to camera and making videos and that just started to spark with me, right? Uh, recognizing that, okay, if others can do it, I can too. And, and yet, Jonathan, I know what kept bubbling up for me is that fear of speaking in public. Yep. And so even though I was um, solo while I was creating my videos, there's just something about having that camera on me that just got me in my head at times, right? Got me thinking more initially. I was worried about how 
what are others going to think of me? Right? What if, what if they reject my ideas? What if my video flops? Do I even have the, the wisdom to be sharing this? And then of course the imposter syndrome that pops up as well. Yeah. Right. Right. When I'm sharing things that I'm passionate about at times it does pop up where I'm questioning who am I to be sharing this information? I'm, I'm not following the traditional path. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a common thing for a lot of people. Um, even some colleagues that I work with express something similar, like they want to be active on, on LinkedIn, but they feel like they don't have anything good enough to say. They don't have anything smart to say, right? People are going right. to watch their content and be like, well, that was dumb and boring and yeah, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, we make up our minds before we even venture out of our comfort zone, right? Because that's, isn't that what you just said? They've already made their mind up and yeah. they haven't attempted it yet, right? So, right? I noticed too when, um, so as I started to create videos, something that kept popping up for me too is I find I lose my train of thoughts at times when I'm nervous and I'm oh, yeah. anxious. And I wanted to get over that. And in order to do that, I actually signed up for a local public speaking class in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all heard of Toastmasters. Sure. Some people like it. Some people don't. <clears throat> I needed to try it. <laughs> and after watching several people on LinkedIn talk about public speaking and talk about their experience with uh, their own Toastmaster clubs in their uh, provinces, I decided to venture out and try that. It was the best thing I could have done. It really helps to refine your message and to get over that fear of making a mistake while you're talking. Yeah. Well, and I guess that makes sense because in true public speaking, there's no edits and retakes. We're in a video. If you totally botch it, you can just do another one, you know? Right? <laughs> so yeah, if you can get used to public speaking. Interesting. Do you, do you find any way, there's any significant ways that public speaking and, you know, creating content on camera are different or do you think they're pretty well overlapping skills? Yeah, I think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, the more, co what I like about Toastmasters too, is it really does reflect, it's been around, it's a, it's a foundational public speaking course that's been sure. around for a very long time. So the, the principles around it definitely can intertwine into creating video and creating content. And, and by that, I just mean it teaches us how to speak impromptu for two minutes. It teaches us how to start a conversation with maybe a hook, have a little bit of um, content to it, and then wrapping up your speech as well. And I found for me, it really helped with taking away that anxiety that I'm going to lose my train of thought. So the more that I practice getting up in public, the more confidence I feel, the less, the less anxiety I have over what others are thinking, and the more I'm stepping into being able to express myself. And that's what I want more than I want to worry about what others are thinking. Yeah. Right? I'm trying, I am professionally looking to switch careers. Part of that is being able to come to camera and talk to my clients. Yeah. That passion is driving me to get over this uncomfortableness. And let me tell you, Jonathan, I've been doing this since last April. I started at Toastmasters. I still don't feel 100%. I don't walk into that class once a week and go, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> And yet I, I'm fueled weekly by the people that keep showing up, even though it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. So cool. Mm -hmm. um, what you learned, what you learned from Toastmasters and really, you know, everything you've learned about speaking better, both on camera and in person, how much of that do you think is technique and knowledge that you've learned? And how much do you think it's just raw practice, just getting the reps in, just getting the hours in? 90% raw practice. You really need to get your reps in. Oftentimes, what I've learned too at Toastmasters is you're often going to be speaking about something that you're passionate about, right? 
when it comes time to me creating my speech, it's going to be on a topic that I have a lot of knowledge about. So that's not the problem. The problem is how do I manage that anxiety when I get to the front of the room? How do I, um, you know, get the mindset, get into the mindset that allows me to express myself without the fear of what others may be thinking? And that in itself, every time you practice and that repetition, that eventually starts to decrease. (laughs) The confidence starts to go up and the anxiety starts to go down. I don't know, Jonathan, do you realize, do you feel that way uh, when you're presenting? Is there a bit of that anxiety at the beginning? What's your experience with it? Yeah, absolutely. It's almost almost interesting. Um, In some ways and in some areas, I I do feel less anxiety going into situations where where I'm talking to groups than than before. Um, But I would say equally weighted with that is the fact that I've just learned how to push forward even though my stomach is a knots, right? Right. And how to not let the knots stomach affect what I'm about to do. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I think it's mostly the reps, right? Right. And doing it. And I've heard other good good, um, advice about those feelings, and that is to harness it as excitement instead of anxiety, right? You're about to do something new. It's exciting. And also, I have recognized the power of the breath. So Mm. when I'm when I'm when I'm speaking and I'm feeling like I'm going too fast and I'm losing my train of thought, it's about slowing down and just taking that breath. And I find that it kind of helps you reset. Well, I I love what you've talked about when it comes to, you know, the anxiety of what am I going to say next? One thing I found interesting, both in social conversations and heck, when you're, you know, hosting a podcast or doing an interview for a podcast, there's a big part of your brain, which is worried about, is this going to like conversation just come to a screeching halt because I have nothing to say next. And that worry about, oh my God, am I going to know what to say next? causes a lot of anxiety, which causes you to not think clearly, which actually creates the thing you were scared of and you actually don't know what to say next. Whereas when you can relax and feel confident that whenever they stop talking, I'm going to have something to say, Mm -hmm. then you can relax enough that your brain hears and listens better and processes thoughts better. So it's it's one of those terrible things in life where we actually create our own monsters, you know, by being scared of or having that anxiety. So Right. And again, it brings me back to the reps, Jonathan. Uh, A lot of times, even though we do this stuff as we're young, we practice presenting in front of others through our education. Not enough. Right. Because as we become adults, we have to go into the workplace and we have to present and we're like, oh, not all of us love that. Right. Yeah. And and the camera's not even on at that point. Yeah, for sure. Right. So one thing that I picked up on uh, as you were talking you obviously had a lot of negative self-talk to work through. Um, mm-hmm. But what helped overcome that was you seem to have a really strong mission, a purpose. Your why seemed to be pretty intact. Can you kind of talk to us about what your why was that helped you push through that negativity? I really am. Um, it's, it's all about being authentic. And for me, I really believe that when we lead from the heart, that is when we were are leading our most our most authentic self and i'm recognizing that every time i come to talk that i'll always know what i'm going to say when i'm leading from the heart it's when i'm not in alignment and when i'm off my beaten path that's when i forget what i'm going to say i feel Oh, oh, I don't know if I'm going to, uh, if the conversation's going to flow. It's when I'm not speaking in alignment from my truth and from my most authentic self that I find those feelings, those, that negative self-talk bubbles up, the imposter syndrome might start to surface. Those negative things come up when I'm off my beaten path. And the more I speak of my truth, the more I, the more authentic I am, the best version I can be of myself, that's when all of that other stuff just goes away. Kind of like, it's kind of like I become Teflon, (laughs) right? I become more confident in my mission and speaking my truth and being my authentic self 
that all of a sudden that other stuff just doesn't matter anymore. Me being myself is more important than what others think of me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and for you, what, what was some of the most commonly repeated self-talk that you had to, had to battle? That I'm not good enough, that I'm not smart enough, that other people deserve success, that I'm not worthy. Those are a lot of the common ones that come up. I think that that anything after that is all coming back to the same message that for some reason I have it in my mind. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And now that I say it, I can see it's when I when you get into that trap of comparison and yeah. you're looking at others not to learn, but rather to compete, then you're a way that takes you out of alignment, right? We're, we need to be on the path where we're collaborating and sharing and speaking our truth. And when we lead from that place, those other things just tend to fall by the wayside. That's been my experience. Now, these, these negative self-talk patterns, did these just emerge for you when uh, you started using video or are these negative self-talk patterns you've been living with your whole life that just you know, came out in, in, in full arms uh, with video? No, I've had my fair struggles with the negative self-talk, actually, Jonathan. It wasn't until I began my own personal development journey that I found a meditation practice. And through my meditation practice, it has taught me how my mind thinks and how it works and how I don't have to believe everything I think. And it's through that consistent practice which I put my reps in every single day Yeah, that I have built up my resiliency to that negative self-talk. So to say that there is no, there is a lot of negative self-talk in my mind. And that is because from a neuroscience perspective, we do have a lot of thoughts going through our mind in any given day. Most of them are negative. Yeah. I did have to learn though that, I don't have to believe everything I think yeah. and that not right. everything I think is true. And the more I became aware of that, the more I was, mm, the more I was, there was this spark inside of me to leave my comfort zone and to try new things then. And through that trial and error is how I'm, you know, building up that resiliency and that confidence to be more of myself and to do less people pleasing yeah. and right. And not to be so concerned about what others are thinking. Do you think that the, the work you've done to get yourself more confident on camera and to work through your, you know, negative self-talk on camera, do you think the, the, that ben- the benefit of that work is kind of consigned to the world of camera and public speaking, or have you found any other areas of your life you're suddenly able to show up more authentically than you used to, even that stuff that has nothing to do with, you know, content and cameras. Oh, for sure. I, so let's just talk about in my family, Mm -hmm. right? I can now have conversations with my family that never used to happen. And as a matter of fact, I find now that a lot of my family is looking to me now they actually seek me out more for more conversation. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, you know, my, my child is going through something. Can you help them? Which is my cousin, right? Yeah. Um, right. So now all of a sudden I'm able to help. I have a lot. My children are also um, at an age where they're presenting in front of their classmates, etc. Mm-hmm. So I've been able to help um, not only my family, but my friends. And I find that a lot of people are, it's often, well, how did you do that? How do you do that? How do you just talk for two minutes on the top of your head, right? Off the top of your head. And actually, I can do speeches now. So what stuck for me in my past was my when my brother got married I wanted to do a speech and I didn't practice and I didn't prepare and I thought oh when it comes time to it I'll just speak from my heart however I hadn't practiced enough (laughs) at that point Um, I still wasn't confident speaking from my heart and when I went up there I failed miserably 
Yeah. Now I don't have that fear. Now when people in my family want to call on me to do a speech or, or to talk to something, to speak to something, yeah. I definitely have more confidence now. I'm more willing to have those conversations with others and, and maybe to maybe give some tips to others that they can do because I know we're all struggling with these, the negative self-talk, the imposter sure. syndrome, the people pleasing. Yeah. Uh, that is that does not discriminate those issues, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right? Well, I, 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 I like hearing you say that because from the work I do, you know, with my clients, I've realized <clears throat> that a lot of this discomfort on camera stuff, it isn't some small little thing of, oh, I don't like my voice, so I don't, I don't like the way I look. Like, that's certainly in there. But a lot of times, the real issues that are stopping people from getting on camera are some really deep-seated psychological, you know, struggles people have had their entire lives with not feeling good enough, with being stuck in comparison traps. And video just brings all that to the surface. Like a lot of us learn how to kind of push that down and mm -hmm. gloss over it in our everyday life. But videos, especially unedited videos, really do bring that to the surface to the point where it has to be dealt with now. But once you deal with it, it suddenly opens up doors for you that you know, weren't available before. And I know also it was interesting because um, one of your questions was to maybe have, has your video changed from the way that it was when you first started to now? Mm -hmm. And so I looked at them. I went back and I looked at my first video and I could barely watch it. And I say that because I, I'm a very empathetic person. And so I'm watching my first video and I'm like, oh, Jen, I can just feel the anxiety in my first video. Then I watched a video I just did two days ago and it was like, oh my gosh, that is like, I'm so much more authentic. I'm so yeah. much more relaxed. I'm just, and now I'm speaking from my heart. Now I'm not worried about some of that other stuff. Which, yeah, like you said, Jonathan, in the beginning, it was all tied up in that, right? Yeah. Tied up in my past and, and those previous experiences that I didn't knock it out of the park and I didn't have confidence when I was speaking in front of people. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you uh, mentioned in particular that was a struggle for you uh, was ageism. And is that something that was entirely internal that you struggled with that, right? Feeling like I'm too old to do this crap? Or was there some external negativity as well for other people telling you you're too old to do this crap? It's not internal. I've not felt that age has held me back at all, actually. I chose to attend university for the first time in my life at age 30. Oh, wow. That, that, was, uh, that, was, that was interesting. <clears throat> yeah, I sure. had the best time of my life, actually, because I wasn't this younger student that still had a lot of issues that I was dealing with. So my whole experience was very different. However, when I started um, creating these videos, it was my coworkers. It was the people that I was working with that yep. were challenging what I was doing. Now that I've stepped away, maybe I see it differently. Maybe they were wondering, like, what is Jen doing? And why does she think she can do this in an unconventional way? She has to, she has to maintain the status quo. She has to do what we're doing. Yeah. I didn't realize that when I was going through it, though. When I was going through it, I took it personally. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, and people were saying, well, what are you doing getting into coaching now? Aren't you a little late in life to be making this change? And I would be like, what? What? I've got another, like, 15 plus years here. I don't want to sit not using my mind and using my talent. Yeah. Right? And, but... You know, this was also coming from someone that I'm 48. He was probably like 27, right? So for him, he's like, well, are you sure that people would like relate to you? And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> yes, actually, there is an audience that would relate to me as well. Having said that, there's also an audience for that person as well, for that guy sure. as well, right? And he, sure. we're just on different paths right now. But yeah. Jonathan, it took me a while to get to this place. I can talk about it now with ease. It wasn't easy in the beginning. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, I know that, you know, uh, a lot of times when I make big, bold moves in my career, interestingly enough, it is like 
my coworkers and peers who I'm most worried about what they have to say. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm close enough to them that it's harder to avoid what they think and what they say. Right. right. You know, if some internet troll hates me, who cares if some guy in Minnesota thinks I'm dumb, doesn't that affect me. But if the guy who sits three desks away thinks I'm a poser, that actually affects me. Right. But they're also like close enough to me to know that I'm in over my head to know that this isn't the real me to know that, I, you know, because when someone who's a stranger learns that mm -hmm. I have my own podcast, it's really easy for them to say, OK, he's a guy who has a podcast because they have no image of me that that conflicts with. True. But a colleague of mine who knows I'm nothing but just a regular software salesperson knows that I don't deserve my own podcast, right? And here's some negative self-talk of my own coming out, right? Mm -hmm. no, no, nobody cares what this guy has to say. So it's, it's almost interesting where people who are total strangers to you aren't too difficult to, to work mm -hmm. through because they don't have a lot of effect on you. Also, even if they're, you know, not just being negative, it's easier for them to adjust their worldview of me to accommodate, mm -hmm. hey, look, this guy runs a YouTube channel. People who are really close to you, like you know, are going to be in your corner no matter what you do. But man, it's that in-between space, you know? People you went to high school with, past colleagues, your boss, your last job, like, whew. And you know what, Jonathan? It just made me think of something. Do you, uh, we tend to attach to that one negative, right? So even though 10 of my colleagues did not personally say, Jennifer, you did a great job. That was wonderful. I saw your video. It was one person one person did come up to me and challenge what I was doing. And that sent me into a tizzy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, what? What about all the other people that didn't comment and that actually like what you're doing and that went out of their way to comment? And that first video I posted did get a lot of traction. I had like 1,500 views, my very first video. That freaked me right out. I was not expecting that. And so... <laughs> I didn't, I was, I didn't overthink it. I just created the video in the comfort of my home and I posted it. Yep. Did not think that, ooh, this could actually grow into something and who knows where this is going to go and all those uncomfortable feelings that were going to surface. I didn't yep. think that all through. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had right? strategies uh, myself to like get myself to do things that I was uncomfortable with, which kind of involve don't don't really think through it. Just take that first step, and and then at that point it's too late, right? Um, sometimes if you knew what you're getting yourself into, right. you wouldn't do it. But if you just take that first step, actually, I, I yeah. use the analogy when I was younger. We used to live on the edge of uh, Lake Ontario in New York, and it's a very cold lake most of the year. So jumping in the water was a bit of a challenge. Uh, <laughs> so my technique for myself was be I'd stand on the edge of the rock. I jump and then after I jumped, I decided whether or not I wanted to come back to the rock or whether I wanted to keep going into the water. And that was the self-talk. I was like, all right, let me just jump and then figure out from there if I want to come back or if I want to keep going. And of course, clearly there's only one option once you jump. But I've actually used that same technique professionally too, where I've said, all right, I'm really terrified to do this. So let me just jump and then decide what I want to do from there, right? And then many steps that you take in life, once you've taken the first step, there's no going back at that point. But, okay. if, but if, you, if you separate that out in your mind and just focus on taking that first step and pretend it doesn't lead to something else, it's a little easier. Yes, and then, yeah, once yes. you post that video on LinkedIn, then it has 1,500 views, and now you're into it, you know? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> yes, I was really into it, and then I didn't want to stop, actually. <laughs> then it became uh, challenging, That's right? Cool. And then I just kept taking one step up after another. And um, the, But the, the tip that I would definitely give is, is to practice and and – Really, I didn't practice on my phone and create a video and not post it. Mm. After I posted my video, then I heard people use that as a tip. And it was like, oh, <laughs> that would have been really helpful. <laughs> Just because maybe that, but you know what, Jonathan, maybe that would have kept me in my comfort zone a little bit longer too. Yeah. Right? So no regrets. Did what I did. <laughs> and I just know that now there's times where maybe I'll go to my camera and make a video and maybe I won't post it and that's okay. I'm more comfortable with it now. So it doesn't affect me in the same way. Yeah. Cool. Well, as uh, maybe as closing remarks here, um, you're someone who has, you know, experienced a lot of anxiety, and negative self-talk going into whether it's public speaking or reusing a video, but you're also someone who's put in a lot of reps and that's really helped you to grow. And that's your, your primary advice. You know, this theme throughout has been just put in the reps. 
any particular advice you have for someone of how to make yourself act and how to power through it and do what you need to do, even when you're feeling this anxiety, even when, you know, your breathing is up and your gut is all twisted up. Anything in particular that helped? Launch yourself. Just like I was saying, don't overthink it and just do it. And that is going to be, because here the, here's the thing, you have to create something first in order to critique it. Yep. I cannot reflect and look at where I can improve if I have nothing, if I've created nothing. And I can tell everyone that the first video is not going to be your best video. <laughs> it's, sure. it's, you cannot start at the top of the mountain. So take that pressure off yourself, have a beginner's mindset, well, which is through repetition and knowing that every day is a new day and that every day you're trying to improve. And that obviously, um, back to my first point there, practice by maybe filming yourself and not posting it. There's an art to where you look when you're speaking. Yeah. And it took me a while to get my my visually where I was looking because that's an art too, right? When you're looking off and you're not looking into the camera, that could appear as though you're not connected with your audience. So there's all kinds of little tricks that you can learn along the way. But I just know that you're never going to start unless you just do it. You have to push yourself off that ledge. It is going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be worth it. You'll find yourself along the way. Cool. You'll find yourself and you'll find your voice. Cool. All right, well, thanks for your time, Jennifer. Um, oh, I imagine a lot of people listening to this are, are going to want to connect with you and see these videos of yours um, and hear a little bit more great. about what your message is. So what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? I, they can find me on LinkedIn and my uh, Jennifer, actually, Jonathan, I'm on LinkedIn as Jennifer Beats. All right. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time. And, uh, yeah, talk great. Thank you, Jonathan. Have a great day today.